By ultra short, I mean pulses that are measured in femtoseconds. A femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds or a millions of a billions of a second. And that is really very, very short. If you take a billions of a second and you compare that to a second, it's like comparing a second to 30 years. Our laser pulses are a millions of that time. So it's like a second compared to 30 million years. So they're very, very, very short. In fact, there's very little that happens on that time scale. What's the advantage of having really, really short laser pulses? I'll mention two of them. The first one is that you can freeze out something that happens really, really fast. In fact, we do it all the time when we take a, a flash picture, except that the flash picture is not a millionth of a billionth of a second, it is a, a, a thousandth of a second. And as you know, is a short flash. You can stop the motion of things that move very fast. Well, with pulses that last femtoseconds, you can freeze out all but the fastest directly observable phenomena in physics. There's very little that happens actually on a shorter time scale that is directly observable. And we're talking here about the motion of atoms or even if you want the motion of electrons in materials. The, 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 the times that are associated with electrons in materials can be frozen out. So that's one advantage that you can basically stop events and study their time dependence very accurately, which you could not do using electronics because electronics measure things on a much longer time scale. At most, maybe a fraction of a billionth of a second, but certainly not a millionth of a billionth of a second. So that's one advantage. The other advantage is that as you make a pulse of light shorter and shorter and shorter in time, you're basically putting more and more light in the same spot in space. A pulse that is a nanosecond long, or one billionth of a second long, is actually about a foot long as it travels through space. When a pulse is measured in femtoseconds, it's a millionth, right? So it's a, it's a tiny pancake of photons that is traveling at the speed of light through space. So in a sense, you've compressed the light, the photons in that light pulse, into a very thin sheet on top of each other. And as you know, when you put a lot of light together, you get a high intensity. I mean, almost everybody has at some point in their life taken a magnifying glass and focused the light of the sun in order to you know, make a little piece of paper catch fire. Well, when you put so much light together in time, in a sense, you're putting it together in space. And then if you also focus it using a lens, you get such incredible high intensities that you can essentially generate the conditions that you have in the sun, or at least at the surface of the sun. And when a light pulse gets that intense, the interaction between light and matter changes completely. Normally, it is matter, like my, my jacket here, that determines what happens to the light. You see my jacket because the light emits you know, photons that come to me and whatever gets scattered and absorbed to you, that determines the image that you see. So in other words, it's matter that determines what happens to light. When the light gets that intense, the roles of light and matter are reversed. All of a sudden, it's not matter that determines what happens to light, it's light that determines what happens to matter. And the reason is that light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. It's basically an electromagnetic wave, and there's an electric field in that electromagnetic wave. When you get to the intensities that I was speaking of, the electric field in the light becomes larger than the electric field that holds the atoms, that holds the electrons in the atoms. In other words, imagine you're an electron that is, you know, sort of in a cloud around an atom. Normally, when light hits that atom, the electric field that the electron feels from the nucleus is much smaller than the electric field it feels from the light. So the light is a perturbation to the matter. When you get to these high intensities, 
it's no longer true. The electric field from the light is much higher than the electric field from the atom. So all of a sudden, the electron feels the light more than the atom. And therefore, all kinds of material properties can be completely changed. For example, the electrons in the outer valence shell in atoms are responsible for the optical and electronic properties. They're responsible for the chemical bonds that hold the atoms together. When you have such an intense pulse that hits the material, everything changes. The, the chemical bonds can be destroyed. The electrical and optical properties change dramatically. So you actually get the opportunity to change matter with light, to affect material properties and even permanently change material properties using light. Now, both of these effects are important and some people who work with femtosecond laser pulses use the short time duration to measure events that happen very fast. That's one of the things in which my group is involved. But more recently, I've been focusing especially on that high intensity part because it opens the door to many things that could not be done before. And right now in my group, we study a number of different applications of that phenomenon. One is the interaction of these very short laser pulses with transparent materials in order to micro-machine them. Another one has to do with changing the properties of semiconductors so they can be used for novel applications. And lastly, we can use these short laser pulses to perform nanoneurosurgery, surgery on a scale that was not possible before. Problems in this area are, of course, the generation of these short laser pulses. It's only in the past few decades that it's been possible to generate pulses that are this short. I think it was roughly in the mid-80s that at Bell Labs, the first laser was made that was able to create ultra-short laser pulses, pulses that were shorter than uh, a picosecond. And for another probably 15 years, it was only a couple of labs in the world, mine was one of them, that was able to build the lasers that generated these short laser pulses. I would say in the past decade, a little bit more than a decade, uh, these lasers have become commoditized in a sense. First, uh, as big laser systems, but much more recently as uh, fiber-based lasers, lasers that ha use a fiber as the lasing medium. Still, femtosecond laser pulses only operate in certain given frequencies. It's not possible, let's say, to generate from a, from a laser oscillator any frequency that is possible. There are tricks by which you can shift the frequency, access other frequency ranges, but the essential frequencies at which femtosecond laser pulses are generated tend to be fairly fixed. And therefore often the problem needs to be tailored to the available radiation. Many people ask me what is the limit of these short laser pulses? Can you go to even shorter laser pulses? And the answer is yes, it is possible to generate what are known as attosecond pulses. So now we're talking not about a millionth of a billionth of a second. No, we're talking about things that are measured in billions of a billionth of a second, but really hundreds of them. So it's a fraction of a femtosecond. The thing is that that is possible only when the frequency of the laser pulse is high enough. If you take a visible light pulse and you go down, let's say, to four femtoseconds, so the type of pulses of the radiation that we can see with our eyes, and you go down to a duration of about four femtoseconds, it's only a couple of oscillations of the electrical field. So as you make it even shorter, you'd have only a fraction of an oscillation of field. And as you can imagine, the oscillation is no longer well defined, the frequency is no longer well defined. So the only way to make much, much shorter laser pulses is to go to higher frequency, which means shorter wavelengths, which means outside of the visible regime. In a regime of the electromagnetic spectrum that has very limited applications, essentially it's a soft X-ray regime, a regime where the electric field is very high, but the frequency is such that the light interacts neither 
with the valence electrons of the atoms, the outer electrons, nor with the inner core electrons. And therefore, there are many phenomena that you, that you can't probe. So in a sense, we've hit the barrier with femtosecond laser pulses. So in my group at Harvard, we are currently studying the, if you want, the dynamics of this interaction of these incredibly intense pulses with matter. As I mentioned before, the interaction of these very intense laser pulses with matter is very different from the textbook interaction of light with matter. Lots of the phenomena that occur uh, at this high intensity do not occur at low intensity. So one of the questions that my group is trying to, here at Harvard, is trying to address is to better understand what happens to a material when it's hit with one of these very intense laser pulses. We can, of course, easily measure the state of the material after everything has happened. But what exactly controls the pathway from the initial state of the material to the final whether or not we have a choice in determining what the final state will be is in spite of a decade or more of work in this area still an unaddressed question.